But the benefit of housing is you don't have that level of volatility. You don't have that level of risk. And you don't have margin calls, right? In a, yeah, in Australia, in Australia. It's, it's very different, obviously, in the, in the US. But also, you have no recourse lending in the US. So, yeah. whatever. <laughs> you just walk away, which is crazy. But, yeah, from, from that perspective, I think that, like, anyone who's sitting there, particularly if they're early in their portfolio, and they're thinking, oh, I don't want to use LMI, I need a 20% deposit, maybe take that opportunity to reframe your thinking because you could be holding yourself. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Dash Not Insider, the auditory epicenter for passionate property investors seeking a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. And on this episode, we are looking at part two of the nine biggest property myths in property investing myths busted with Olivia Ward. This is part two. If you missed part one, we will link it in the show notes so that you can go check that out. Uh, or if you're on YouTube, we'll probably link it in the video somewhere where you could just like click there and go there because it is awesome. In the last episode, we covered myth number one, that you need your own cash to invest. We successfully debunked that myth number two, that you should buy your own home first and then invest later. That is a, one of the biggest myths in property investing for sure. Myth number three, that you need to be in a job for six months before you can borrow money to invest, which is not true. Myth number four, that you need to be a high income earner. We discussed how there are many people investing in property and building a property portfolio with with less than six-figure incomes, $60,000, $70,000, $80,000 incomes, they're successfully growing a property portfolio. And myth number five, that you need to buy property locally so you can touch it, feel it, get close to it. We debunked that myth completely. Liv, welcome back. I'm excited to get into the next myth. How are you today? Oh, good. Let's get into it. Let's get deep. Let's go. Okay, so myth number six, and these nine of the biggest myths in property investing busted, is that lenders mortgage insurance, or LMI for short, is a bad idea. And this is a big one. I have seen so many investors scared of paying LMI to the degree. And I, there are successful investors that I know that have got significant property portfolios, say 10 plus property portfolios, that have given advice to other people that I know that have said, you must have a 20% deposit to invest or you shouldn't invest because LMI is bad. And now, this literally, I had a conversation with someone last week who that the individual said they have a borrowing capacity of like several million dollars, right? And, but they were told by this other person who was successful that they needed to 20% deposits and stuff. And so they were like, oh, I don't have enough capital. They wanted to go buy whatever, six properties. And I was like, what are you doing, dude? Just pay LMI. And he's like, what? I was told that it was bad. So why is LMI not a bad idea? <laughs> oh, first of all, it can allow you to hold on to more cash so you can get into the next deal quicker. Number two is that usually the cost of your property will outperform the cost of LMI anyway. Number three, once you understand inflation, well, I don't want to go too deep onto inflation, but debt is irrelevant with inflation, let's be honest, so it will just erode away. Uh, and number four is that the LMI can also be added in to like the overall 30-year mortgage as well. It's literally a tool that I have personally used to fast track my wealth and go hard, but I also um, I don't have much fear around property though either because I understand property. And usually people that have this decondition, this assumption or this belief system that LMI is bad comes from you know, an extra cost, but that extra cost can literally be a tool to – go faster and quicker. Yeah. A lot of people think, oh, it's dead money. A lot of people think it's dead money. They're like, why would I pay lenders mortgage insurance? It's just another cost. It's dead money. It's like, well, it's not really. LMI gives you the ability to put less of a deposit into the property. So it's not dead money at all. In fact, it's a tool that is allowing you to buy more property with less cash, which I um, will dig into this a little bit, right? Because then some people go, but isn't that risky? It's like, well, you know, you you would need to believe that number one, your property value would go down more than 10% in order for that to be truly risky, which basically never happens, right? And number two, you would also need to believe that if that did happen, the bank would then turn around and sell your house at a loss, which wouldn't happen because they wouldn't even recoup their money. Right. And so the act the net actual risk putting a low de- in a low putting a low deposit in a property is is so so ridiculously low that 
it's hard to even quantify realistically. Now, to be fair, your your mortgage payments would be higher because you've got more debt. So there's you know there's an element of that you've got to consider. But from a from a risk management perspective, there's bugger all risk there. Now, from a cost perspective, you touched on my favorite part of it, is that generally speaking, it gets rolled into the loan. And if it gets rolled into the loan, who's paying for it? Your tenants. So 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 let's say the let let's say the LMI was five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars. I don't really care. Whatever you want to say, and that gets added to your loan. So you've got a five hundred thousand dollar. Let's say you got a five hundred thousand dollar loan. That's that's suddenly getting another five or ten thousand dollars added to it. Okay, cool. Over thirty years. Okay, got it. And you're not even going to pay that mortgage. Why do you care? Because your tenants are going to pay that mortgage. So who cares? And five or ten thousand dollars. Spread over thirty years, even with an interest rate on it, divided by like so. You do, so it spread it over the thirty years, and then divide it down into monthly payments. You were talking such fractional amounts of cash that it is probably a cost in, of a coffee. <laughs> exactly, probably the cost of a coffee or something like that each month. It do, and versus the accelerant that that puts into your property portfolio, right? And now there are obviously purchasing costs, and I'll, I'll oversimplify this. But let's say you're buying a five hundred thousand dollar property. If you put in a ten percent deposit which would require that you use LMI in order to do that, and you buy a $500,000 property. Uh, and So you're putting in $50,000 of cash to buy a $500,000 property, which again, you need more money than that, so it's not an exact calculation. And if the property goes up by 10%, you've made a 100% return on invested capital. If you put in a 20% deposit, that's $100,000, right? Hey, no LMI, woohoo, how cool. Uh, but if the property goes up by 10%, you've only made a 50% return on capital. So you can literally double your return on invested capital by using LMI and for something like several dollars or at least like, you know, very like very low double digits of of dollars in order for you to be able to get that capability, which to me makes it actually seem like one of the best tools that you can use for accelerating ROI. Now I'll put a caveat on this and I'd love to get your take on all this again in a second, Liv. But you need to think about how that relate, how that whether that is the right uh, approach for you. Now, for a lot of people, when they're getting started, maximizing return on invested capital is number one, the goal, and two, the preference, and all of this kind of stuff. Okay, and so if 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 accelerating your return on invested capital is important, probably because you're starting out and you're trying to get ahead as fast as possible and all of that kind of stuff, then you're probably going to be like, hell yeah, let's do this. If, however, uh, maximizing your return on invested capital is not as important to you, and again, people might people listening to this listening to this might be thinking, "Well, why wouldn't that be important to you? What are you being? Are you being you know you know facetious or something?" No. If, for example, you might be a business owner who already has a decent amount of risk exposure through business and also has a lot of capital coming in, you know, the idea might be like, actually, you know what? I don't. I I, I my preference is just to take things a little bit easier and to lower my risk profile and. You know, just to, Cash just to, yeah, just, you know, keep more capital in the, you know, like, a, so maybe it's not right for you, right? So it's not for everyone, by the way. It's not for every set of circumstances. But to rule it out and just to kind of have this kind of like view that LMI is a bad idea is, is just crazy. That's like, that's the equivalent of, of saying, um, the only way to successfully invest in property is to buy blue chip properties in Sydney and Melbourne. It's like, well, that's not true, you know? So, so it's just like creating these false beliefs can actually really, really hold you back. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Yeah. And to the point of the person, the successful business person who's able to put in larger deposits, most people aren't in that situation and can't do that every single time. Bingo. So yep. I definitely couldn't. It's just the harder way. I think putting in, you're getting your, high, uh, your highest ROI on your invested capital is literally the, the smartest number one uh, metric that I'm always consistently trying to measure at the start. Yeah. I mean, me, me personally... Uh, my strong preference is to maximize my ROI and to, and to increase the diversification. So if I had, let's say I had $500,000 in cash and I could go buy five properties with a 20% deposit or 10 properties with a 10% deposit. Like, oh, I'd I know take what, the 10 diversify any day. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like, okay, give me the 10. Like, you're like, like give me the 10 because- you know, from a portfolio basis, the the likelihood is I'm going to get significantly greater returns. So my ROI in each property will increase, even if, even if one of them was a dud, it wouldn't matter as much because I'd have a broader diversification in my portfolio and a higher return on invested capital. And so, 
there are limits to this, by the way, right? And you really got to think about leverage strategically and not haphazardly. Uh, I think Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, one of those two guys, said um, like there's only there's only two things that make uh, wealthy people broke, and that's you know leverage was one of them, right? Leverage was one of the two. But they're, what they're talking about though is leverage on um, stocks, all right? Leverage on shares where there's a high higher volatility. But the benefit of housing is you don't have that level of volatility. You don't have that level of risk. And you don't have margin calls, right? Um, in a, yeah, in Australia. In Australia, it's, it's very different, obviously, in the, in the US. But also, you have no recourse lending in the US. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> you just walk away, which is crazy. Um, but, yeah, from, from that perspective, I think that, like, anyone who's sitting there, particularly if they're early in their portfolio and they're thinking, oh, I don't want to use LMI, I need a 20% deposit. Maybe take that opportunity to reframe your thinking because you could be holding yourself back. And if you're someone who has equity in an existing home and you're starting out to try to buy uh, your first investment property, maybe you already have enough capital within your home or PPR that you might be living in to not have to do that to begin with. Um, and that's something also that I would just work closely with with your broker as well because it's also a balance of pulling out too much equity also that might hinder your borrowing capacity and bring that down. So that's something that you'd have to balance out. Yeah, bingo. And this is where having the right team around you really matters, right? Having people that you can rely on, that you can talk to, that can look at the numbers and get through. So people like a broker, people like yourself, Liv, uh, people like Dashdot, who can actually help you to walk through this. Because trying to work it out yourself is really, really hard, you know? And uh, you getting the right team around you is critical to getting to the success that you want in property. So myth number seven is that you need to get out of a fixed, or you need to wait until your fixed rate has period has finished before you can refinance the line of pullout equity. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I th- I think this has been a lot more common recently because there's been a lot of people in the last 12, 24 months who locked in at lower rates. So during 2023, going into 2024, probably got a, lot more, a larger cohort of people locked into a fixed rate. Now, a lot of people assume that they need to wait for that fixed rate to end before they can go and get a pre-approval or pull out equity. That's not true. So, it depends on the flexibility within your existing loan terms. There's actually most amount of lenders will allow you to pull out equity and still be locked in to say, well, sure, you just want to take more money. So, we'll extend it, give you more money now. And it just might mean you need to go get a pre-approval with somebody else. Who cares? So, yeah, you don't have to be locked in. Um, you could pull out equity and get a pre-approval much earlier. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And the, thing, the way to think about this, right, is there's the break fee. Right, and so a lot of people think if you want to break your fixed your fixed uh, term, you're probably going to have to pay a penalty fee, right? Which is why I don't like fixed term loans generally, right? And my opinion, not financial advice. Do whatever you want, right? Personally, when someone when there's a break fee attached to a fixed interest loan, they're pricing in the differential of if it was a variable rate, right? So they'll price that in. So broadly speaking, the chances are if you plan to refinance at any stage, you're probably just better off going variable, even if the rates go up, right? You're probably still better off. But the thing you gotta you think you gotta think about is let's say you've got two years left on your on your um on your fixed rate term, and let's say it's gonna cost you ten thousand dollars to break the to the as a break fee. Now, in the first instance, you should be like ten thousand dollars. I'm not gonna pay ten thousand dollars just so that I can refinance a loan. Okay, fair enough. But what you're actually saying is if I pay $10,000, I can unlock my ability to continue to borrow and build my property portfolio faster. So would you pay, pay $10,000 in this example to build, to, to build your property portfolio two years faster? Then you've got to think about, well, what would I be able to do in that two-year period? And what would the compound rate on the properties I buy, would that be worth more than $10,000? Chances are, yes. And so even though, and we've been in, Gabby and I have been in this position before as well. We got hung up um, pretty early on. And, and, you know, and we basically said, okay, well, we're not going to pay the, it was $5,000 we had to pay. Um, there was a variety of reasons we didn't pay it, but we, we got stuck in there. We're like, damn, like you got to pay five grand just to refinance the loan. And it was, um, and it was pretty gnarly. But if you're in a position to be able to buy, or if you want to buy, like it's a, it's a, you know, it's a cost you got to pay, but it's actually going to help you to accelerate your property portfolio faster if you can get past it. So I would say, don't even be scared of that if you can afford it. Mm-hmm. I did that. I paid six grand. Yep. To get out of a loan. I think I had like I don't know, four or five months left. I was like, yep, makes sense to do it. I'm going to make more money over here instead. 
Yeah. And guess what? Sometimes you've got to pay money to learn lessons. A lot of people pay money to go to university, right? <laughs> like all, all education has a cost. All education has a cost, right? And sometimes it's financial and sometimes it's not financial. But sometimes you've got to learn about debt by paying stupid things like break fees. In fact, yeah, I was talking to a business owner the other day and uh, he's, anyway, he's, he's got someone on his team that is paying way too much money. Like just way, like just so much money. Like they just set him up with this. He's like, uh, I'm paying this person like probably double what they should be getting paid because they kind of made a mistake, right? And they just didn't know what they were doing, right? Uh, and they're like, what do I do? I'm like, well, you know, like that right now you need that person. So look, guess what? For the next like six to 12 months, you're just going to have to accept that you've made a mistake and that's the price of that mistake, right? And so you've just got to learn sometimes and remember that all education has a cost. So just because you don't like it doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay it, right? Sometimes you're just going to learn from it and go, okay, what can I do in the future to avoid those sort of circumstances? I love making those mistakes too. Mm -hmm. I get to celebrate that I never have to make that again. Yeah, exactly. 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 Love that. Love that. Uh, awesome. Number eight. Second debt. last one. Second last one. Debt is bad. <laughs> Probably one of our fa- fa- favorite oh. goose that we share. Similar I to love Alibi. This. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What's your take on this first before I riff on it? Um, look, to me, you know what? Actually, three years ago, Goose, you actually asked me, what's your position on, on debt? And I said, debt is an asset to me. Debt is leverage and it's a tool to fast track you to get to build wealth doesn't matter if it's in business or in or in real estate. And I love debt purely because I can use other people's money, OPM, other people's money to fast track. And debt is also tax-free as well. When you go and say, hey, babe, can I please pull out some more of this equity? Right. So like, let's just say, for example, you wanted to increase your wage by $10,000 that's earned income, you pay taxes on that. Whereas if you go and then ask the bank for an equity release to do the same thing, that would be tax-free. <laughs> you wouldn't pay income tax on that. So, de- and also, I mean, I have a, a fair good understanding of inflation and that like debt is irrelevant with inflation. Such a big, powerful sentence, that sentence. Um, that for me, I personally, non-financial advice, my personal opinion, I actually have a goal to obtain $10 million worth of debt with the hope that that will just have a pretty good indication of the future, that it will just erode away over time, that that debt will. That's where my mind is and we're conditioned to believe that debt is bad. It's not. I know. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, I think debt's one of the best things ever. Like, I'm a big advocate of debt, right? Yeah, you're going to be careful, right? You're going to be careful. You're going to be, yeah, so what, what kind of debt? Okay, so credit card debt, probably not great, right? Because it's quite short term and it's quite high interest rate. Um, getting debt on a depreciating asset, not good. So getting debt f- to buy uh, like car finance, that's not good. That's not smart. Even though, to your point, inflation devalues debt over time, the reality is on most like car loans and stuff like that, the time period is not long enough and the rates are too high and the value, the underlying value of the asset depletes at such a rate that the differential between those two things is not is not useful, right? You still end up net negative. Same thing on boat finance, right? And things like that, right? So uh, unless there's a way to make money from it, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, you can then look at depreciating assets and then say, well, could I make money from this? So for example, if you were getting debt, if you were getting finance on a car, which in the first instance sounds dumb, but if you were then renting that car out for a profit, right, then that is very useful, right? That is very useful. That's good debt. If you're getting debt to buy a property, that's great, right? Because the underlying asset is going to be going up in value, or most likely at least not going down in value. There's going to be income associated with it. You're building an asset base. Even if you're getting debt to buy a business, right? There's a lot of people in business where like debt is bad, debt is bad, debt is bad. It's like, no, it's not. Not at all. Particularly if you can get it on long terms. Short-term debt tends to be not as good as long-term debt, right? So Give me, give me as much debt as possible, put it on the longest terms and off we go. Happy days, right? Short, short-term short debt tends to be less advantageous um, unless there's already a built-in upside. So for, for example, if you were going to borrow a million dollars at a 20% interest rate or let's say 10% interest rate uh, uh, for 24 months, okay? 
you would need to make you would need to be able to take that million dollars and get a greater return on that than the the you know broadly speaking the twenty percent um, that you'd be paying back in total on that million dollars. So then you got to ask yourself, is that possible, right? So depending on what you're borrowing it for, that's going to indicate whether or not it is good. But broadly speaking, I think that's that's brilliant. I had a um, I had a uh, a, a pretty successful business guy I was I met with uh, not that long ago. And he was trying to tell me that, that all debt was bad. And I was just like, I was like, I don't, what? He's like, yep, everything, your business, all businesses should be bootstrapped. This was his philosophy. All businesses should be bootstrapped. You should only ever pay for everything in cash. You should have no debt in the business and no debt. You should just have no debt. And I'm like, what, what, what the, what the hell? Like, that doesn't even compute for me because you can go 10 times faster. You can build a property portfolio. You can do all this kind of stuff if you use debt. Um, but it's all about understanding it and being able to use it well. And to your point, by the way, it's one of the best ways to to be able to access capital on a tax free basis. Because if you have a property that goes up by a hundred thousand dollars, and then you refinance a hundred thousand dollars of equity out of that out of that um, property, that's not income, right? You're not paying tax on that. That's debt, right? So there's no tax associated with it. So all of a sudden, you get a hundred thousand dollars tax free that you then go get to use somewhere else, preferably for another investment. And then, by the way. If you've, if you've taken out out of an investment property, your tenants are going to be paying that mortgage and the interest that you're paying on that $100,000 that you took out is tax deductible as well. So you've taken $100,000 out, you're paying no tax on that $100,000. You then go get to put that $100,000 into something else that's going to make money. And the interest that you're paying on that is tax deductible. But so it's, it's like, it's free money. Like, what the fuck? Like, it's crazy. Like Three birds with one stone. I know, it's, it's, it's insane. And so- you know, like one of the best things you can do, in my opinion, is to is to understand how to use that uh, strategically and use it to your advantage. Now, just to be clear, just so we're all on the same page, that doesn't mean necessarily, depending on where you're at in your, in your stage of wealth development, that you should have everything leveraged as hard as you can get it, right? Um, because that can create an unhealthy portfolio over time. That can actually create a pretty sick portfolio. But depending on what stage you're at, that might actually be a solid move. You may actually want to like redline it. Like, what's the maximum amount of debt that I can get on every property I buy so that I can go as fast as possible? And then let your portfolio rest, right? And then let it let it grow itself back into a bit of health and get down it. You know, a good portfolio LVR is probably going to be between, you know, 60 and 80% over time, I think. I think if you're any less than, say, 60% uh, leverage in your portfolio or even 70%, maybe, like you've got, it's lazy, like it's lazy. Even even an established portfolio, um, like you've got inefficient capital sloshing around in your ecosystem that you're not putting to work in the right way and getting the right returns on. So, you know, it's one of the biggest secrets to the wealthiest people on earth is that using debt strategically is the fastest way to get ahead. It's such an amazing tool of fabrication because here's the thing: the whole system is built on this this idea of debt. There is not. The amount of cash that circulates in, in the in the world is like, you know, several trillion dollars of cash, theoretically, right? But in practice, like 10% of that money actually exists globally, right? All of the rest of it is theoretical money, right, that gets moved around through computer systems based on promissory notes, which are considered debt, right? So once you realize that the whole monetary system is built on this fabrication of shit that doesn't exist, you realize that it's it's... It's fictional, right? So it's like, our system. Go get some. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, guys, so you're telling me that you can just you can just make money. You can just make this. Okay, great. I'll have some. Thanks. Uh, and if you get stuck in your own head and you say, no, I'm never going to be, I'm not going to participate in the system and I don't want to owe money to the banks and stuff, that's fine. But just like question, just ask yourself, what are your values? Like, what is it you're trying to achieve in life? You know, I'm not, you know, maybe being debt free is going to be great for you, but- Ask yourself if you're really disconnecting from the system because you're probably still connecting into it in other ways as well. Mm. Like most people end up with, you could literally have $5 million worth of debt but be cash flowing $200,000 of passive income and that was your original goal. Then who cares about the debt? Yep. Yep, totally. There was another, I had another scenario this week actually. Uh, Aaron, who was, it's the same sort of thing with like the interest rates where you might need to cop a high interest rate to begin with in order to get the next deal across the line. It is. But then usually a few months after that, six, 12 months later, you can go refinance, move to another lender and get the lower interest rate. 
that the That's interest rate is tax deductible. Yeah. This is what everyone forgets. It's like it's like oh, I got to pay a high interest rate. It's tax deductible, right? So it's like it's like okay, like who cares? Like two things that like when you're starting out, starting out is the hardest part. Okay, and most people are starting out. So statistically speaking, most people are starting out, right? Starting out is the hardest part, but once you actually start to get some traction, the two biggest things that you can do to accelerate your wealth, reduce your taxes and increase your debt. It's pretty simple. More debt, less taxes. Right? It should be the mantra. More debt, less taxes. I might actually get that on a t-shirt. Actually. And if you can do those two things, you're, you're going you're gonna to move a lot quicker. So anyway, I'm mindful of time, Liv. We've got one more myth that we need to get through. Sydney and Melbourne are the only place for higher growth. Gee whiz, a lot of people would have you believe that. A lot of people would have you believe that. A lot of people would say things like, billionaires wouldn't invest in a shack in Upper Kambukta West. They're only going to buy properties in Bondi Beach, right? But that's just not true, is it? Particularly if you look at the last couple of years. What's your take on this? My take on it is I built a multi-million dollar property portfolio off not buying in in Melbourne or Sydney. (laughs) Correct. So it's not true at all. And if there's opportunity, wherever the opportunity is, that's where I'm going to go. Yep. 100%. And, this fi- you yep, go. go on. There's 15,363 suburbs in Australia now. It's gone up a little bit. Uh, like there's, And there's always somewhere that's going up. There's always somewhere that's going down. There's always going to be optimal performers. Sometimes, sometimes those suburbs are going to be in Melbourne and Sydney. That's normal. But sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're going to be other places. And also there's going to be, even if they are in Sydney and Melbourne, there's also going to be other places that are also growing. It's not like they're only growing in Sydney and Melbourne. It's just that that's the centricity of our media that say, look at this, this is going up. And so it creates this belief that the only way that you can get ahead is to buy, buy blue chip in a ring, all of this kind of stuff. And to be fair, if you, if you have lots of money and no uh, information, so for example, let's say I had $50 million in cash and I had I didn't have dash dot and I had no idea how real estate worked and I didn't and I just didn't understand the market at all. Uh, what I would probably buy in Sydney and Melbourne. Right? I'd probably be like I'd be like all right, it's probably a safer bet. That's quantified on two things. Number one, tremendously high amounts of cash, and number two, no ability to understand how the market works. And if you have an ability to understand how the market works, then all of a sudden you can become what's called an, an informed investor. And then you can realize that there's other better places to put your money. Because I mean, you know, Sydney and Melbourne become pretty, any any market that becomes relatively unaffordable, so I have to use that term in the, in the context of, of relative local affordability, becomes more volatile. Because inherently, people aren't able to sustain, they're constantly at the limits of, of sustainable affordability. We looked at a suburb comparison between um, a suburb in Western Australia, which the, let's say, I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say the median house price was like, Four fifty, something like that, and the and the and the median local income was, I can't remember exactly. Let's call it fifteen hundred bucks, right? Or let's say it was two grand, whatever it was. Uh, then we looked at, like, I think it was New Farm in Brisbane or one of the inner ring Brisbane um, suburbs. The median house price was two point five million, and the median household income was the same as it was in WA, right? And it's like, okay, so the prices are like five times ish more expensive, but the income is the same. Tell me how that's a more stable market. That doesn't seem like it's going to be more stable to me, right? So not only is it not necessarily the place for high growth, it's also a higher risk proposition in, in my point of view, depending on where you're at in your portfolio. This is not to demonize those markets because there is a place for those, but typically like this belief that you have to go there to get to get the growth is just a, a farce. Yep. And that's something that I've seen, like your the results of what your team find, when I'm looking at the ROI and the growth of that everyone's getting, I'm like, 30%, 40%, 60%. I was like, this is wild. And this is what everyday Australians are getting outside of Melbourne and Sydney areas. And whenever that time to your point comes in your journey where it makes sense and the area and the data makes sense to buy in those areas, awesome. But I just wouldn't restrict yourself to saying, well, this is what I believe because this is what the data has shown me in in the media for the last 20 or 30 years or mum and dad have told me that this is the other place you can buy. Um yeah, I would be open to quantifying that and grabbing the data and reach out to experts like yourself and your team. 100%. The, the other thing as well is like that belief stops people investing. 
Because if you believe if you believe the city of Melbourne are the only place to get growth, right, which is naturally what you want, and if the median house price is a million dollars, then you're going to say, well, unless I've got a million, unless I can buy a million dollar property, there's no point, which is not true. And so, realistically, you could be getting into the market at much less than that. And so, as a bit of a kind of market insight at the moment, I guess it, you know, below four hundred and fifty thousand dollars right now is very hard to find high quality assets. Um, but if you're at to say a five hundred thousand dollar price point or five hundred and fifty thousand dollar price point, which is basically half Sydney and Melbourne, you can buy great properties. You can buy great properties that are going to perform exceptionally well, and so you could get in at half the price or less than what in Sydney Melbourne because Sydney Melbourne you know those those median house prices might be 1.2 1.3 1.4 1.5 you can get into the market for half the price and go twice as fast potentially i mean it's it's crazy so letting go of that belief and understanding that there is a whole country to invest in is going to be the fastest path one of the fastest ways to accelerate portfolio as well yep i am it you know what this you pe- most people would also know like an area as well where they're like there's a good side and a bad side to an area as well. And the same thing goes with all of Australia. There can be a good side and there could be a bad side to a particular state even. Um, so, yes, there we go. M- miss number nine. Miss number nine. It's been a marathon. We've got through all nine. How do you feel, Liv? I feel good. I feel really um, content that hopefully – there are a lot of people that have listened to the last two episodes that have dri- that has this is like driven them to decide. You know what? I'm just gonna not assume and just ask a question. I'm gonna reach out to an expert. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And so, speaking of reaching out to experts, of course, if you're ready to invest, then of course, you know, head to dash.com.au and um, book a discovery call with our team. But if you are not sure, if you're at a stage where you're like you want to get some advice, you need a coach, you want someone to go, like help guide you through that process. Liv, where would they where would they get in touch with you? How would they reach out to you? Oh, uh, just any social media platform. Just look out for any Olivia social Ward. media platform. <laughs> Olivia Ward is just she's just she's everywhere. She's all over the place. But it, but to be fair, if you go on any social media platform, Instagram, anything like that, and you search for Olivia Ward, you are going to find her. Uh, and so ping her a message, get in touch, because having someone to talk to is sometimes the biggest issue. Most most property property investing is a lonely sport. So having someone that you can reach out to and say, hey. I need, I need some guidance, I need some advice, I need some coaching to get me through this to help me get started. It can be one of the best ways that you can get started on your property portfolio. And obviously, we've been working very closely with Olivia for the last uh, few years and it's a great partnership and a great relationship. And I'm, I'm a big advocate of everything you do, Liv, and all the people you help. So uh, if anyone is thinking about that, then I encourage them to, to reach out and connect with you as well. So Thanks, Goose. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, if you've liked this episode or the last episode, make sure you share it with a friend, family member or loved one. And until next time, stay awesome, stay powerful, and we'll see you on the next episode.